Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another session of Reef Therapy. I'm Jeremy Gay and today I'm here with Paul Hughes of Advanced Aquarium Consultancy in the UK. Hi Paul. Hi there. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Good, good. Um, we've got some snow in the UK today. It's um, unusually snow. cold for the time of year. Yes, yeah, 10 centimetres to 15 where I am, so it's quite deep, so... Yeah. Okay. Perhaps. Well, that anyway, is quite for the, deep, actually. For the yeah. UK, not for, not for Canada. Yeah, and it and it tends to bring our country to a standstill, doesn't it? Yes, a it little does bit of snow. Change, yeah. 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 Well, I'm up in the north, and the snow's not too bad actually. In fact, I've just got a bit of frost. I know. But, um, the south. I saw on the news that Sun- you- south. Yeah. 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 Sunny yeah. Essex is not um, very sunny today. <laughs> no. No. So, um, let's introduce you properly then, Paul. Paul Hughes, AAC. um, Tell tell us and our our listeners a little bit about yourself and your store. The store actually started as a sort of subsidiary to the maintenance and installations that I was doing, uh, which started around about 15 years ago. Uh, The store actually really officially opened to the public about 10 years ago, but Prior to that, I'd worked for a quite well-known North London uh, marine outfit called Home Marine, which had been uh, established since the 70s. Ah. Um, and yes. Now, that, that had a rather nice... Go on. No, go on, carry on, Jeremy. I, I, I was just going to say that had a rather nice display tank in it, which um, was very notable for its quality. And um, so that was... You had a hand in that, then, I take it. Absolutely, yes. It was actually myself and Barry that um, uh, Russell's, who's now the new owner, his father, that uh, I installed that with. And that's where uh, I, I suppose a lot of that in, uh, inspiration for a display based store, that's where my ethos for the idea that, you know, you have to have quality displays to reassure your customers that you know what you're doing and what you're talking about. I and agree. also with today's tech technology. You know, there's so many new products that come out all of the time that you need somewhere to bench test them. And uh, we're certainly, yep. I would say, we're definitely not what I call a box shifting outfit. We, we don't just shift boxes. Yeah, we yeah, have yeah. to know that the products actually really do say what they do. Fortunately, nowadays, they most of them generally do. You know, most products that are launched, yeah. are, so, you know, whether they're uh, consumable, you know, there's a lot less, how should we call it, snake oil based products on the market today if anything you need to learn how to advise those customers how to actually use those uh, products <laughs> and uh, i think too much is lost purely over the internet as such well it's different now i mean i was saying to someone recently you can't just be a good aquarist or a good reef keeper now you've got to know about software and you know connecting all these devices it's a different job that we had you know 20 years ago now people are coming in saying i can't connect my lights you know and now my corals are in the dark yeah. and you're like what am i going to do yeah you know? well that's different. actually probably my different. biggest weakness is uh, technology i <laughs> still very dependent still very dependent on lots of uh, youngsters in the firm and uh, around me and uh, yeah. a couple of guys that I yeah. call in. But I do attempt attempt these things. But the technology side, yes. But um, I'm still very much so, really, uh, less less technology and more biology. If I can't attribute the biology to it, then I don't need the technology. Um, and with regards well, to a lot of the automated systems and stuff that are out there, I always try and educate a customer to learn first the ropes before just jumping into high technical equipment. Yeah, absolutely. And just going back to the display tanks, that's something that I've always kind of prescribed to, you know, if a store, if you've never been to a store before and they can show that they've got healthy fish and corals in a long term display, that's half the battle won, isn't it? And and then on your side of yes. things, you can then, you know, if you've got several displays, and I think, I'm, you know, you can correct me, but you've got, you know, like an easy SPS and, and then like an Acropora and a Softy and an LPS. And that, again, makes mm. your job and the job of the, the reef keeper so much more easier in that they can select and go, well, actually, I like that one over there, Paul. And you can say, right, this is what you need to do that to achieve that. Yeah, fun, funny thing is, most people come into this uh, reef keeping world with the idea of a mixed reef aquarium. 
But I have to say yeah. that's probably the most difficult subject that there is, is the mixed reef, which is actually, Go when on. you look at it in terms of na nature, it's, uh, it's you'd never find it. You know, so in other words, if you just uh, specifically set off on a road to keep uh, SPS corals, for example, and you set up a tank around those, which probably would include, say, a bare bottom, so you can keep that velocity of flow higher, whatever. That's rather easy if you set if you set these systems up as they're meant to be, it's fine. But the mixed reef, which appeals to most beginners, where we, you know we can cherry pick a little bit of everything from every environment learning the uh, flow patination alone um, is uh, is quite a task. So what we tend to do is is that in the store, we'll have, for example, just to get, go and talk about the displays, we've got a little Red Sea Max Nano Peninsula, which we concentrate on soft corals alone, that first stepping stone yep. into the world of just keeping some salt water and some small hardy fish and, and things. Then we move on to, say, the uh, hardy SPS tank. That's the tank where if you have a particular hobbyist who's maybe already done that entry level system, but they want to try uh, keeping SPS corals for the first time, I want them to be productive. You know, there's too, too mm. far reef, too many, uh, sorry, too few reef tanks out there nowadays that are not productive. You know, where they're uh, yeah. really sort of concentrating on the trendy corals, for example, Many of those species that are trendy and in demand are often very difficult, like torch corals, for example. You know, they're always, you know, I see I many beginners just jumping on torch corals uh, straight away. And, of course, we all know that they're probably one of the most testing species that there are. You know, so the idea sure. of providing these different displays is to really give the uh, consumer some sort of choice with, well, this is, if you want to do this, you can do this easily with just that. If you want to do that, mm. you're going to need to really look at this. And also, it also gives them an idea of value, because what I tend to find yep. nowadays is a lot of uh, beginners come into the hobby, they see the trendy corals, they buy into that world, they're then buying into the technology world as well. And, and, it's, and it's almost all or nothing. In fact, they're often superseding their income. And then when they have some failure, that's when we see reef tanks in the second-hand market. And it really comes down yep. to, I really do believe in this, that you cannot be a store experience. You know, I know that, yep. including myself, we all use the internet on a daily basis for our shopping. But when it comes to fish, corals particularly, you'll never get it right, if, unless you're an expert already, of course, but you'll never get it right just by ordering online. You really need to get out and go and see some. Even if it's a fellow hobbyist, and you and they and they school you, but you definitely need yeah. help when you're starting out. Like uh, starting out, you will not get all of that from the internet or a Facebook group. Yeah, and also I was saying to someone just at the weekend, you know, it's I enjoy visiting shops and looking at fishing corals, and you know, if if, if I'm going to buy something. I want to look at it first and I want to see it and I want to yeah. assess it, especially with fish. I want to watch it for five minutes to see if it's flicking or not. You know, it's it's yeah. just one of those things, really. Absolutely. It's, um, I it, mean, it's, it's the something other I grew up I've... going into fish shops, you know. Yeah. Go on. I mean, the, the, the other thing particularly that many people might be uh, as well not seeing is, is that if, we, if I tell you that we have a paid uh, a biologist on site, He's never run out of work no. since he's been with me for three, four years, a higher grade. Um, and every week he'll discover a new pest. Only last week we discovered that there is a new pest now um, that eats trachophilia. So it's a specific flatworm to specifically trachophilia. Who would have thought it? I never even knew that one existed. Yep. And I'm 35 years in in the trade. And it wasn't that long ago. Yep that he discovered another type of flatworm as well on a recent shipment. So everything that we, uh, every week we're learning, and if we're learning every week, then that's why I think it's really important that when you're buying corals or fish, you ought to be seeing them. Because if you're buying from an online only source, for example, all the time, there is always a risk or a chance that you're not seeing the fish with velvet in the system. You know, or the, or the fish with spot or the this or the that. You just can't tell from an online only store what those conditions are like where those animals are kept. 
don't get me wrong, there's some incredibly reputable online sellers in the UK. And I was straight away, I'm thinking of one who's fantastic, who's very thorough with all of their shipments, has a fantastic success rate with uh, sending out corals and fish as well. We used to do fish, not so now. But with fish, I think that's really fundamental, you know, buying fish online. Unless, of course, you're in a situation, as some are, that may be disabled or they can't get out of the house. But get in the car. That's what I say. Get in the car. Mm. Pre-pandemic, mm. we used to see people, and pre-Brexit, I won't go into Brexit, but pre-Brexit, we used to have <laughs> visitors from Belgium, we used to have visitors from Holland, yeah. France, uh, Spain, Greece, we've had people from Pakistan here, believe it or not, who were visiting family who popped in yeah. to see us. And, you know, and then I'll get someone moaning that they've got to drive two hours up the road from Croydon or somewhere like that. So, <laughs> as I said, it's uh, used to be a hobbyist thing, but whereby, including me as yeah. well, actually, I, I went out on a little tour myself. First time I went out on the road to see a, uh, uh, some fish stores was uh, last year. And I actually went up to the Midlands and I, yeah. I loved it. You know, a lot of people would think, yeah, it's you know, great, isn't it? Coral. Yeah, I even bought some corals yeah. from the guy's shop. You know, a, a guy in the Midlands <laughs> called yeah. Tees Reef, which was uh, yeah. superb. I came back with a chalice coral, I've which is there. growing away in the DD tank, mm -hmm. and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't mm -hmm. think he could believe it. I, when I said to him, uh, can I buy that coral? He thought, <laughs> I think he thought I was joking, you know, coming from AAC. But yeah. I, po I positively yeah. also popped in to see uh, Lee at Marine Aquatics up in uh, Birmingham as well. What very, a great very store. good shot. And, uh, so, so, yeah, yeah, so if I get that buzz, and I've been doing it for years, I, I really positively mm. want to say that's a positive thing. Get in the car. Take, if, if fuel bills yeah. are a cost or a problem, then share. You know, there's enough hobbyists, yep. as I found out on my uh, recent birthday event that we had here. We had 150 people walk through the doors over a period of two days. It was it was rammed. And I because I really thought the night before, <laughs> is anyone going to come? Pre previously, yeah. at birthday events have always been well attended. But I didn't imagine at this period of time with the way things are that we would see it's that many now, people. Yeah. And, and, and also to other stores that might be watching as well. Uh, other stores put the effort in because you'll be amazed that if you create something that people want to see and want to do they'll come and uh, they are there yeah. they just they just need some encouragement to get them out the door okay so on that note i've never been to your shop so i'm going to come down paul but what i recommend to someone if they want to come down with me four five ten fifteen people let's get a minibus let's come down to paul's shop from the north we'll all chip some money in yeah. let's have a day out you know it's gonna yeah. it's gonna be yeah, fun we did, actually we, we we had a few guys from liverpool when we did coral freaks that uh they left at four mm. o'clock in the morning there's dedication for you and they all come down to uh uh, Coral Freaks, which was uh, really successful, actually, or more successful than I ever imagined it would be. But, yeah, before pre-pandemic, uh, pre pre-Brexit, pre come on. That was a show that we did. Uh, it, was a, it was a tester or a trial show. The whole thing was, you know, it was, a, it was advertised as a tester, if you like. And it went absolutely fantastically well. However, trying to run a business and putting on an event is a is a uh, is a very difficult thing to do. I mean, it probably cost me nine months worth of worry. Yeah, every weekend, you know, you had felt like if you if, yeah. if you hadn't of a, a I'm sure the guys at Reef Palooza when they first started out went through all the same emotions, and now they probably just because they do yeah. so many, they just don't even think about it. But but when you first ever put on or attempt to put on an event, you think, yeah, that's great, let's just do it, and then all of a sudden it dawns on you that. If you've got, as we had about 300 people, nowhere near the sort of 6,000 people that Reef Palooza will see over a period of a couple of days in Florida, for example. But, you know, you've got to think about fire safety. You've got to think about first stage. You've got yeah, to think yeah, yeah. about insurance. Yeah. You've got to think about there's a lot more to putting on an event. And also you've got to make sure it was interesting. And uh, I've learned, I learned a lot from that one because that one was we had quite a large hall. But it was all within one hall. So that meant the talks, right. the uh, dealers and uh, you know, the livestock selling and the dry goods guys were all in one hall, which meant that when the speakers were on, people had to stop buying or 
sit down for a minute and listen. In actual fact, it worked really well. But then we did have some fantastic speakers. We had uh, Jamie Craggs, who, of course, everyone will know worldwide now. And uh, we legends. had David Coral Saxby. spawning legends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we had David Saxby, of course, uh, and of course we had Brian Schaff from TMC, which is uh, not many people have really known Brian by this point, but he did a, he did a fantastic yeah. talk on um, collection of uh, Lemon Peel Angels, for example, uh, which oh, okay. actually sort of, you know, we're looking at the basically the sustainable capture, you know, versus uh, tank yeah. red and that sort of thing, which is a very yeah. emotive subject uh, uh, at the moment, as I'm sure it is. you understand. Yeah. You know, this uh, everything should be tank red, but should it? You know, so you know, so yeah, it was. It went really well. well. So that was that was probably a highlight. It's, but it's, do I want to do another well. one? <laughs> and at the moment, do you? at the moment, what with the two years worth of COVID and everything else, it hasn't really given me a lot of time. But there are some small yeah. events that have been taken place here over in the main building, not actually in AAC. Um, a new little event, a, a little thing set up by a hobbyist uh, called Paul Longhurst Fish Palace, is known as, as in, on Instagram, called Love to Reef. And uh, he just okay. did uh, a, a, tiny, a tiny event for 50 people, 50 reefers, and it was magnificent. Uh, believe it or not, it was, it was a right. very small... I, I understand when pop stars do these... Uh, small events for a small room of people yes. what what reward Intimate, what reward they call it, it yeah. gives back yeah um and it was really really great we had uh jez from uh ecotech mm. there doing a talk on flow and lights we big had up, laura jez. doing a, a little yeah big up jez and a little bit from laura carlin as well on gonopora and her, uh, her firm as well so and some you know there's some little stalls okay. there the fluorescent uh painting lady jez pink uh, oh yeah i love all that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was great. So I can't help but, you know, need to say this. You know, if there are other stores that are feeling a little bit down with the current economic climate, make it yourself. Yeah. You know, you've got to encourage yeah. these uh, uh, people out the door. And when they do, honestly, the sense of community amongst reef keepers is superb. Yeah. Once you've got a room full of Good. reef keepers, it isn't long before they're shaking hands, discussing their tanks, maybe swapping a few frags in the future and... It brings the community together, and I'm really happy to be involved in encouraging that side of, of the hobby. Hobby, for me, is still very, very important. It's not all about putting money in a till, I can tell you that. Absolutely, and we're still both hobbyists, and I'm sure, you know, I could probably speak for you when I say that every time you, you get a new box of fish and you open it and, you know, you're looking in the bag and is it bigger than usual, is it different, you know, it's like Christmas still, isn't it? It's just super exciting. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's probably the most exciting part of the job, which is, uh, it is you know, isn't it? That, that you, yeah, you're waiting, you're thinking, where, where is he, where's the guy, where's the delivery, where's this, <laughs> or if you're at the airport praying for the plane yeah. to hurry up, you know. That sort of thing. But as soon as you're back, you're like a kid, a kid at Christmas. And, you know, even yeah. this uh, past week, um, a little trip to TMC. But we also have one of our direct imports this week from uh, uh, Mauritius. And uh, I'm opening the boxes and, you know, and, and all of a sudden you see something. You think, well, I've not seen that before. Yeah. Or I've not yeah. had that yeah. species before. You know, and sometimes, particularly yeah. from that location, I end up with a few fish I didn't even ask for. Yeah. So... You know, so you never really yeah, know. And, yeah. and, and recent, recently, even on a generic barley supplier that we use, one that lots of people use across the UK, that's uh, Sto uh, Stony Coral Supplier, I recently opened up a box and come across a brand new species of Fabia, never seen or for that I've really? never, ever seen before in my life. Yeah, yeah, some sort of camouflagey, greeny, different khaki, greeny thing, you know. And I said, oh, you know, 35 years, I've never seen that. And that just come from a generic supplier, not a particularly special supplier. But, yeah, you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. Still still their level of excitement. For I think a lot of LFS owners would uh, would say that, you know, there is, there's is—it's got to be some perks to the job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's talk about um, the Essex Coral Farm then. So this is, um, if you could just tell us a bit about it. Obviously, I've heard about it. Is it on site? Is it off site? What is it? Well, basically, that's how really it all started in so many words. I was working as a retail uh, sales staff for Home Marine. 
and I can't yeah. remember the years. I'm diabolical at remembering years. But anyone who's watching this who's <laughs> seasoned will know. There was a company in America years ago called Garth, Geothermal Research yes. Foundation, yes. I think it was, yeah. Um, yes. And I never, I always thought it was, I've never forgotten it because it had such an odd name. It didn't say We Grow Corals mm. or something. It just, it's this strange name. Well, yeah. that company, I, I must have been about 23 years old. So I'm 51, mm. 52 this year. And that company was the first, it was the, it was when I was first on the internet. I mean, this, we're talking, yeah. you know, pre Facebook selling, pre Instagram. Yeah. You know, I, I think I'd only just got a mobile phone. Yeah. 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 yeah pre broadband. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and mm. this uh, company that I was studying at the time, they were the uh, first company I knew that were really uh, uh, cultivating corals on a on a regular basis. Uh, and they were nothing particularly uh, flash that, you know, it was things like sarcophytons and uh, le levitostals, that yeah. type of thing. Um, but I that was it. the first level of inspiration. So Essex Coral Farm actually started in my back garden, yeah, in a brick-built shed that I had. Um, and I just concentrated on a few species, and one of the, you know one of the species was the uh, acropora. I'll say it Jamie's way or, or uh, David Attenborough's way. Acropora, <laughs> acropora, montipora, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it was acropora. the uh, Philidia, you know, the tricolour acro. Okay. And I had ha hundreds and hundreds of this uh, 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 coral, and uh, and, uh, and and a few other species as well. And there was about four or five of us on eBay at the time. So I suppose by now I'm probably about 26, I suppose, 24, 26, something yeah. like that. And that was at the time when really I started, if you like, this Essex Coral Farm vibe. So I, I would say it's probably only about four or five of us. Clayton from Briefworks was one of them. He was already getting yeah. involved in a, in a big way, uh, based from his home in Bromley. And I was based over in uh, Essex. Mm. And that's where that first started. But that was fundamental for my long term uh, thing, because I felt that, well, if I take some from the wild, but then I'm fragmenting them as well, I'm sharing the love. And mm. we're only borrowing a coral. Yeah. We're not we're not getting in faulty corals. And I came from a time where I remember that pre pre this very special period of, uh, of realising the Berlin system and the possibilities of uh, keeping stony corals in captivity and things like that you know it, you know there was a really a very much my my grandfathers in the industry have been very much used to getting dead white coral you know put it in a bleach bucket mm. and fish tanks were set up with that mm. sort of artificial white dead coral look so to actually in fact we used to even terrible as it sounds when we used to receive shipments years and years ago from the philippines and uh, places like that of dead coral the dead coral wasn't always that dead and there we were throwing it in a bucket full of bleach, you know, to uh, to put it in a system to today where we've got Jamie Craig spawning uh, these corals in captivity. Uh, interestingly, at the weekend we had uh, Sven Fossa visit us on Saturday and he was one of the first oh, wow. few people, of course, to, yeah, he came Saturdays uh, on the on the page, if you have a look. It was fantastic. I mean, he's obviously a hero of mine. Um, and uh, a pioneer. You know, those books that, Oh, absolutely. In fact, they all said he was a liar. You know, uh, you know, we had Stuber, of course, with his first acro, and we had Wet Pets down the road, Romford, that had its first in Essex. That was the closest thing to me that actually had a, uh, an acro growing in it at the time. But they're, they're, they're the early days of that coral farm in idea was the idea was that we would share the love a little bit more. Um, and I was yeah. studying yeah. it all the time. And, of course, in combination later on with the installation and the maintenance side of things, I was able to provide all of those installation customers and clients with um, with hardy grown aquacultured corals that early. Of course, right. as yep. the demand grew, the insatiable demand, as I call it, for marine organisms worldwide, of course, my farming... Yep became has become less you can't grow them fast yeah yeah oh well no i can't and the reality is is that some of those heirloom species are not trendy anymore so they've been lost a bit like uh, british apples you know everyone wants a braeburn <laughs> but there's hundreds of british apples that no one would ever eat you know um but i tried yeah. to hang on to some of those but i'd sadly quite a few of those are no longer in production not being very favorable 
but I still keep a library wherever I can of those uh, easy care corals. Do you know anyone who still has that original line of the leader? Uh, yeah. Well, there's one, actually, that we can't be sure whether it's a, the actual one or not. But there's one piece in okay. this shop still that's probably got an ancestry of about 22 years, which looks very similar to my Valida. It could be yeah. my Valida. But certainly mm. um, one of the corals that everyone in the UK uh, takes for granted, and I, I'm going to claim it as mine, yeah, is the lime green, lime green branching hammer, the multi-coloured uh, lime green branching hammer, because... That, that is a lady, okay. actually, when I was working for Home Marine, I remember selling, when we were getting corals back then from Lombok in Indonesia, I got one piece of branching green hammer, and I planted it in this system near St Albans, uh, a, a very, very good client of mine. No expense spared. Just do what you want, Paul. Spend what you want. That's how good it was, this particular <laughs> client. And, uh, you know, she really, as I've often said to her, built AAC, if you like. So it was... Uh, and she right. let me do what I wanted. So there was no, no question of cost or anything like that. So I put planted this slime green hammer, and I'm not joking, Jeremy. I, I, it just grew and grew and grew. And the other interesting thing was is over multi-generations of daughter polyps and fragging and things, we've now got this hammer all across the country. Um, I've seen it. Right. Hobbyists have bought it off me. They've traded it with someone else, and they've traded it with someone else, and they've tried, and it's just spread like a germ across the country. Yeah. And one of the interesting things yeah. about it is not only is it phosphate resistant, it's also brown jelly resistant as well. We find tend to find ah. that when this, the, yeah, when this species is it within um, uh, uh, most people's aquariums, even if they've suffered a brown jelly event, this particular hammer seems to get through that with no problems at all. So there is a lot, there's right. a big shout out for aquaculturing corals, certainly. Um, and that's Absolutely. probably one of the biggest biggest successes. I mean, even things that people again take for granted, like Stylophora, the purple stylo that yep. everyone's had at some point yep. in their life in the hobby, that, I believe, started out life with Martin Lakin. And that's throughout the entire right, okay. country because because that stylo originally came from, I believe, Norsica in France uh, when uh, the, the what used to be called the Kent Muppets on Ultimate Reef. They went off to Norsica right. and came back with a few species, uh, Pablo and Martin yep. and a, a few other guys. They went there and they came back with this. And, of course, that's why the Americans never had stylocore or pistol art or the, the, the purple stylo. And we did. Yep. Because it actually came in on Red right. Sea live rocks originally. Even the pulse coral, even the I white see. short pulse coral was originally, I believe, yep. Terry Evans's. Yeah, And it was at a time where we were getting Red Sea live rock shipments, which I believe elsewhere in the world yep. they hadn't. Yeah, and uh, But they're the success stories of those early farming days. And that's the type of thing that I was growing. It's all easy care stuff. And, of course, the plethora of Ceratopora species that I've always... I still do to this day, main time. And well, now, have you got a pink Ceratopora? Well, because that's pink the seems to be thing. disappearing. There's, well, the pinks only disappeared, I believe, because of the lighting that we're using. Yeah, the pink okay. is still there. The Fiji, the one that people mostly refer to as the as the as the pink Ceratopora, we had two. One was originally coming out of the South Pacific from uh, Walt Smith, and the other one was coming out of Indonesia. But the, they're, they're, those colours that we, we're not seeing now, I actually believe that's down to the way that the coral was morphed to to the type of lighting we're using. So, I, uh, okay. so lots of people don't realise, but if they put all their lights, all their LEDs to white and white only, you will see those pink tones that are there. And when we yep. used to have, for yep. example, metal halide at about 10, 14K, yeah, we would see yep. this pinks. We would see blues. We would see pinks. Now, yep. when you're using lots <laughs> of heavy blue light, you don't see that. Yep. Yeah. So very often if you That's take right, a picture of a blue. Yeah. So lighting's changed yep. dramatically, of course, you know. 
this this is just up Jake Adams Street as well. This this was one of his ah, you know, last conversations well, about lighting. Say, Always bangs on about yeah. the, the 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 white light and and the blue corals. No one wants blue mushrooms anymore because you can't see them under blue light. What happened to the purple Formosa? No one wants it anymore. Absolutely. And you're probably right. Yeah. A lot of these a lot of these bird of paradise ceratoporas, which are kind of neon green, are probably quite pink mm. under white light. So, well, they yeah. are. I mean, even but, um, the yeah, sorry. even the. Uh, the deep water green ceratopora, the green bird's nest that um, some people yeah. w- will be familiar with. If you push that, now that species actually needs to be in lower light. If you move okay. it up to higher light, it will actually go brownie green. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And interestingly, on her, uh, it's a, a, a little name drop, that's fine. Uh, Mike Paletta came to the store once along with Tony Vargas. Yes. Um, and, and the one coral we really wanted was this deep big water up Tony, green. Big up Tony, big up Mike. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, deep water green uh, hystrix, which wasn't again. It's funny. It's it's really odd because obviously when you got people in your store that you must have, they must have seen you before. You know, we are only little mm. England. You know, but uh, actual fact mm. uh, on those visits by a few US guys to the store, they've often said to me, they said it's amazing. I said, what do you mean? Well, we never see so many colonies. We never see this species. We never see that species. So believe it or not, you know, we're always looking to the U.S. as, oh, they've got all the corals. But the reality is, is that yeah. everywhere you go around the world, you will find, particularly down to local hobbyists, actually, and uh, you know, you will find some species that is either unique or doing really well in that area or that territory. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's... Um, you know, I, I was somewhere the other day where I saw this chalice coral I've never seen before, but I probably have. It's just that when it's been in captivity for a long time, it will take Changes. on a different structure, a different shape or a different yeah. colour. But lighting, going back to your original thing about the pink ceratopora, they're still there. Mm. It's how you light them mm. that, that will really determine the way that they look. Sounds good. So, so the, the farm then, Paul, so is it, in your store now i mean is it just some trays is it are you actually arcing species and variants have you got you know tell us a bit about that yeah i mean right so unit four which is where the shop actually began so i used to when i was living this side of town rather than this side of town at my old house where the brick i still kept the farm the farm was running for quite some time while i still had the store so unit four was where the store actually opened um, and as times progressed and we needed to expand, we kept the old shop and turned that into a farm and quarantine, yeah, uh, for the fish. As, and we expanded yeah. into unit six and unit seven. But in the farm nowadays, it's a mixture of species. It's very difficult. We, as I said, we still hang on to what I would call species that are unique to the store or that they were ancestral species that i've kept in fact uh, when we had uh, yep. another name mark march from frag box came cool. in and i said this this is this is my um worst coral i've still got lumps of brown poor rights he said what are you keeping that for you know i i try <laughs> to keep a little bit of everything just in case one day we need enough. it um and in fact the edinburgh yep. university actually needed a little bit of poor rights not that long ago you know, so for an experiment that they were doing. But as I said, we do. Yep. So we have in, in, in there, we have what are called fragged corals. That might mean that a chalice, yep. for example, that's coming, it's so expensive that most people can't afford, you know, 700 pounds, 800 pounds, 1,000 pound retail. That will go likely go to what we call the chalice palace, where it will be rested for a, a, a period of time, make sure it's made a full recovery. And then we will frag it. And that will be what I call a fragged yeah. coral. But then we'll hang on yeah. to one of those pieces and then try and grow that and from there frag that. So in theory, we'll have fragged corals and we'll have aquaculture corals, but from the same species. So in other words, we might have yeah. F1s, but we might have F2 six months down the road when we've hardened it off. Usually uh, most customers can't wait. I just want a bit of that. You know, so we try and encourage the sure. idea that we... Uh, sit on some of these but very often the, i mean the customers are sort of determine what we've got left and uh, recently with one of our uh, purely aquaculture pieces there's one that's floating around uh, the aac sourberry 
which uh, is an ancestral Malaysian species, if you like, very similar to the PC rainbow, if you like. That one, my okay. customers have more of it than I do. You know, <laughs> it's got to a point well, where the I demand was so... <laughs> well, the, the demand was so <laughs> high for it. You'd probably be able to buy it, honestly, off of a hobbyist easier than you can buy it off me at the minute. Yeah. Because, you know, I've got a few yeah. tiles with a few mothers on them, so, so big, mm. yeah, um, but we can't frag them because we can sit where we got to a stage where we're consistently fragging it. We ended up with just stumps, like old stumps. Yeah. And I know uh, when I was talking to Christian yeah. Pond not that long ago, he, he, uh, a couple of years ago, he's just starting out. The trouble is, is you get such a demand. You think, well, you want to keep him happy. You want to keep her happy. You want to do this. And in the end, yeah. you end up with nothing. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Yeah. It just uh, starts doing trust instead, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You just end up with some sort of tile, which is like a flat pancake acro, you know, yeah. where it's been nobbled to, it. to death. So the farm aggravates yeah. a lot of customers because I know that they would love to just go in there and rape it, as I call it. But we have to really hold <laughs> yeah. bits back. I would say mm. to you that I feel that coral farming, in the manner that I've been doing it, is potentially a dying art for me. You know, I'm looking at new things now yeah. rather than coral farming. I think there's so much of it out there now that everyone's a coral farmer. Um, you know, that we, was, I, I was, was going to ask you about that, Paul. So, 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 mm. so 30, 35 years in the industry and in the hobby, mm. are we in a better place now um, in terms of the hobby than we were 30, 35 years ago? Or are there kind of swings and roundabouts? I think there's swings and roundabouts. Um, obviously, I'm getting older, so I become more miserable, more grumpy. It seems a natural progress of a lot of men. My <laughs> back's not worse. But, I, but, I, but yeah, but I, but I would, I would genuinely say that there are some things. So, for example, the level of success that people are having is is fantastic yeah. because you know, providing they do talk to a decent LFS owner, or they're getting, yeah. a, or they're being schooled by a very good hobbyist. There's no reason for them to really be failing, only if they're pushing the boundaries beyond their expertise. I mean, you know, you could set up a soft yeah. coral aquarium today, and with the level of technology and equipment that's out there, there's absolutely no reason to fail, apart from, of course, yeah. pests. You know, pests is obviously yeah. something that, you know, any any fine gardener would suffer with uh, box blight, for example, or, a, a, you know, some sort of caterpillar yeah. or crap. Or grub. So there's some things that are out of your control or can be out of your control, despite quarantining as well. I'd like to add there, you know, you can do all the quarantining you want. But as Christian recently said to mm. me, which is quite a good statement, he turned around and he said to me, you just can't quarantine the bacterial problems out of some of these things. You know, you know, there are certain mm. there are certain limitations to quarantine with corals, uh, uh, certainly. But on the majority of it, where aquaculture is being carried out, there is a possibility to end up with what I call a pest-free environment. But then you've got to trust your customers to yeah. only shop for you, and that never happens. So, you know, you can put all the effort you want into aquaculture and, and coral farming, but ultimately, do people yeah. actually really, you know, understand, you know, what goes into that? And I know, for example, yeah. an aquacultured frag um, is worth way more than a fragged coral. Yeah. So, for example, yes. you know, so I know I know it's very difficult in the UK to get what we see in the States. You know, when I when I uh, visited Top Shelf, you know, to see their farm and it was it was an absolute dream for me. They are actually still selling corals for what for, for what they're worth. Um, you know, whereas yeah. over in yeah. the UK, I would say that the mindset is is that I'm not paying that because it's got a silly name. No, the silly name's <laughs> not there yeah. to increase its value. You know, and uh, I've often yeah. had to explain before that, you know, you wouldn't call a, uh, a cropper a microclados, um, you know, the one, the brown one with the red polyps. No, no, no. We know it's strawberry mm. shortcake. You know, names are not what add yeah. value to a coral. Names are so that you know what we're talking about. You know, that that's the thing. But in yeah. terms of the hobby level of success, it's wonderful. I cannot, you know, say enough. I think that we're in such a fantastic position today. I mean, Jamie is the evidence of that. If, as a hobby, we didn't have the toys for our hobby, Jamie would never have yeah. been able to do his bit. So, in terms of that side that, of it, that, fantastic. In terms of trips, the other you side... Are, you you are... Uh, 
Uh, ex- exactly right. I, I was I was writing about um, the pillar coral in the Caribbean today, and um, it's just been yeah, IUCN red listed, which is terrible. But the guys that are saving it, the Florida Aquarium, they spawned it based on Jamie's research and, and the coral lab. And Jamie's using equipment that we use. You know, he's using radions. He's using you know, Triton mm. method and all these different things. And and it's I love how the hobby is responsible and could be a massive part of saving the reefs long term yeah. i think that's well, great well something that's really and uh, sven actually brought that up the other day you know when it, he, he, he laughs now when he visit his stores it visits stores or visits uh, hobbies or whatever and he sees all these stony corals growing and things like that when people called him a liar all them years ago you know you never do it it won't work it won't you know and all of that so where we are now is just phenomenal but I would say the one thing for me that's really changed, which is really upsetting and uh, is such, is the trophy culture, what I call the trophy culture. You know, for me, when I look at uh, 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 Pleurogyra sinuosa, a bubble coral, I'm looking at that as an animal for what it really is and how amazing it is. Yeah. I'm not looking at see whether it's <laughs> yeah. the green one with the red stripes in it with the gold dots on it, you know, yeah. and it's £18,000. Yeah, I think people need to learn to enjoy their hobby, but understand and enjoy the physiology, uh, you know, and the biology yeah. of their reef tank and the animals that they keep and, and stop worrying about keeping up with the Joneses in terms of I've got the latest yeah. torch curl. I've got the latest to yeah. Just enjoy your Don't hobby. Don't follow the fashion. Tro- yeah. Trophy culture is something that I see as the bad side of the hobby because we can actually push species you know uh, the, the, an insatiable demand on, on, on a particular species like the gold torch coral at the moment we just use it as a general term the gold torch coral you know yep. i don't believe that the amount of torch corals that we see are all being maricultured properly they can't be because once yep. upon a time we never saw them yeah hardly ever yep. or if we did see them back in metal halide days yeah they were brown yeah, so there was yep. no insatiable demand for that particular species. But the advent of LED lighting, of course, has made to see our corals with different eyes. Yeah, and ultimately, we've almost created a, a situation now where trophy type uh, culture is, is taking place. And of course, I know me and you, we won't touch on that today. I know me and you have spoke about uh, illegal species and things like that that are in the hobby. But, you know, that's what causes this. So we could actually push exploitation based on an insatiable demand for a trophy species. So in terms of the hobby, you asked me, I told you, half of it, I'd say, is fantastic. We've moved so far ahead. But the other side of it that I feel is very dark is the idea that we've uh, pushed into a, a trophy world. And that's that's nothing to do with names. Let's make that absolutely clear. I believe naming corals isn't isn't wrong. You know, because just like when yeah. I go to the garden centre, I might buy a lemon scented or a, a, a or a, a, a lemon meringue rose. What's wrong with that? You know, we yeah, know yeah, that yeah. it's going to smell of yeah. lemons. We know it's a rose. I haven't got to find mm. a Latin name for mm. it. We all know what we're talking mm. about, the same as we would do with a strawberry shortcake. Um, and, it, yeah. it, you know, the naming and the aquaculture side of it and adding value. Hobbyists need to understand mm. that if people are aquaculturing corals that's one of the reasons why i've dropped it a little bit because hobbyists do not often understand the value that goes into an aquaculture piece so if someone um has set up a business that's based around aquaculture and aquaculture alone good luck to them it's going to be one of the hardest journeys because as i said we, we until lots of people in the uk absolutely understand that aquaculture really is the way forward with corals particularly yeah um i'll have to come back to the wild bit a minute we still need our wild corals coming in we can't just survive on aquaculture alone but particularly we sure. need to understand that there is a, a lot of value with aquacultured species but likewise we we should try our best to to look at these corals for what they are they're not trophies they're not toys you know and uh, the other thing is is that in bob fenner his words, you know, let's be conscientious at aquarists. Let's make sure that yeah, what we're yeah, doing yeah. Sense, is sensible. Okay, brilliant. So, moving on, um, let's drop another name. So, I believe a Mr. Jake Adams turned up at your store, is that right? 
No, no, Jake's Jake never never made well, not that I know of, but I mean there has been people turn up here when I've not been here and uh, but but no, as far as I know, Jake's not been here, but uh, but recently, um, I've seen Tony. We've had Tony here. We've had Mike here. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think. Yeah. We've had a few others. We've had Mr. Saltwater Tank here. He came here once. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's been there's been a lot of people come through this store because we sit quite close to London and quite close to Stansted. It, we do tend to see a lot yeah. of international visitors, and of course the suppliers love it yeah. because. It's a little place for them to stop off in, so that the our international visitors get a taste of the UK, if we like, yeah, and from a reefing perspective. Yeah, but, <laughs> no, the Jake Adams thing. I mean, um, we, I think we should actually talk about that for a second. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Let's. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you were you were one of the first people to um, to message me when you know the news broken obviously you were away and we can discuss that in a minute and you know thanks for the sentiments and again the outpouring that you know the british guys and all across the world um you know gave to jake was was amazing and, and you you said to me privately the other day you said some really really nice things you know yeah well jake was one of those i think that you know yeah we, we both said this the other day, you know, he, uh, there was all sorts of things. Some people didn't like him, some people loved him and all the rest of it. But one of the most important things of all is uh, is this, Reef Builders. And uh, I remember when Reef Builders was quite fresh and quite new and straight away I jumped on it. It was like really for me, it was the first quality, um, the first quality reef keeping online magazine. That's the way I look at it. It's an online yeah. magazine of, of top quality, mm. yeah? Because, and Jay, and, and you can only have a top quality magazine if you've got a top quality people in it, yeah? And uh, with yeah. Jay, uh, for me, he was a complete inspiration because he was doing everything I wanted to do. I was wrapped up in an LFS, <laughs> you know, stuck in stuck in a yeah. business in an LFS, but he was doing everything I wanted to do, whether it be in the Solomon Islands yeah. or whether it be here or whether it be there. And um, as uh, as uh, you know, and I and I, I really I'll, I'll I'll miss that bloke an awful lot as I know you will. Um, and I just I've just yeah, well, I've got, I've, 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 been... I don't know if you've got your uh, I've brought my beer to uh, toast him. Well, I, I, I know that you to, beer I'm with. Fu- uh... Unfortunately, I've got no beer, but I've got I've got my drink ready because uh, the snow today meant the snow meant that I couldn't uh, get out and about today. But I know we said we was going to have a beer, and yeah. uh, certainly tonight when I get in, I will, because uh, there. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I will miss that man. And uh, he's been a, he was certainly a big inspiration for the international side of things that, you know, and the people yeah. that he met. And everywhere he went, by the way, whoever I meet who met him, so we'll yeah. talk about. I know we want to talk about Mauritius in a minute. Exactly. Example, yeah. But, I've, 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 but, yeah. I've got. I've but, got a few other points because this. Th- go on. Go on, Paul. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that the impact that Jake had on people all around the world as well. So that boy, he went to uh, Mauritius and stayed with uh, Monika in 2013, and I saw photographs while I was over there, and the impact he has wherever he wherever he went, the enthusiasm. You know, it was infectious, you know, and um, I just, as I said, I'm really pleased to be here today because I know that obviously this is one of your first podcasts, is it? It is, yeah. Yeah, my it, second one. Yeah, uh, uh, and uh, I think, um, you know, he'll be really pleased to see Reef Builders uh, carrying on and uh, I'm sure you're going to do a fabulous job, Jeremy. I, I really do. Thank you. Thank I you. I think he'll be really proud. Um, Thank you. Um, well, let's talk about Mauritius then, because this is this ties in nicely with um, you were walking in Jake's footsteps, literally, and you were out there mm. when he unfortunately passed away. But you, you, you tell us about this Mauritius thing, because we're going to go on to a very special fish that I want to talk about. Yeah. You've got loads to tell us about it. And um, so yeah. how come you went right. to Mauritius then and how did that all come about? Right, the first, well, the main reason for, I mean, there's a couple of things. Obviously, during COVID, I worked myself to death, as did my missus as well. Um, you know, uh, at first, I thought the game was over. It's never going to, you know, who's going to want tropical fish in a pandemic? Yeah. And the next minute, we were Scary working, times. as was every retail store at 300 mile an hour, just to achieve 
what the customers wanted, you know, all stuck at home. And it was fabulous, the business really. But of course, we were knackered. We absolutely, um, uh, uh, you know, totally run off of our feet for a t a two years and no holidays. And prior to that, you know, I've been quite fortunate in the fact that um, you know, I'd gone a nine, nine years with no break, basically, when IAC started. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be dead. If you want a good LFS, you've got to work. And uh, in nine years with no break, I had a couple 100%. of weekends away during that period. But, you know, as staff grew, I was able to have more time out, obviously. But the uh, real reason for going to Mauritius was really... At my age now, I've, I've and how long I've been in the street, I have literally sold thousands of marine organisms. And there is yeah. obviously some conscience with what I do. If there wasn't, then I really need to leave the game. Uh, you know, if it's only, if it's only yeah. all about the Agreed. money, you know, I, I need to leave. You've got to care, you? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You've got to care because if you want never the quality... Get, you never want get the, complacent about, um, about live animals. Absolutely, never get complacent, and don't forget your reviews are king these days. You know, like, you know, nowadays you've mm -hmm. got to be. So if you're not, you know, you've got to be conscientious about what you do. And I wanted to find out, um, really, I wanted to see like a provenance from from start to finish, from seeing where uh, seeing what the environment was like, where the fish were being caught, and how they were being caught, and how they were being handled, all the way uh, to my store. I wanted to the whole process. Okay. I wanted to understand it. I wanted to know what environmental impact I might be having, uh, and all the rest of it. So obviously, as I've got older, I sort of, especially like I said, with the insatiable demand today compared to the tiny industry that I used to be in. You know, it used to be a tiny industry. Twenty boxes of hard corals mm. coming into the UK. You know, it's probably like more like two hundred or three hundred boxes of hard corals coming to the UK a month or whatever. You know, in in good times. Sure. So. You know, it's 10 times probably the consumption. And uh, for me, obviously, I'm the man who puts them in a bag. You know, so ultimately, I want to yeah. know where these animals come from, how they're handled and stuff. So combining, if you like, a, a breather, a bit of a holiday, a bit of a trip as well, just, you know, um, and work. And uh, uh, if you like, that's what Jake did um, and uh, interestingly, yeah. I knew that um, obviously uh, we'd only spoken about Jake actually a day before this happened as well, because I was sat in uh, in Mauritius in uh, the Garobi's household and they were showing me photographs okay, yeah. of everyone that had been. And originally when Jake first went there, actually, and not many people know this, but the Garobi's used to have like a little, they've got, they've still got it to this day, a little off license, if you like, yeah. And uh, okay. their flat was upstairs, and Jake actually stayed in their flat as an international traveller, backpacker, if you like. So early days oh, of right. refill was before hotel budgets, should we say, probably. Um, wow. and, um, and, and when we were talking, I, I said, uh, did Jake ever get to, because it was him that actually encouraged uh, uh, Monika and uh, Papi Yam uh, uh, to look for this rare tank. Jake knew about it. He knew it was there somewhere. And they knew, Papa Yam knew where it was there as well. And it was Jake that actually encouraged, you must look for this fish. That's what Jake said to him. You've got to go look for it. So they went out and they went all over the island looking for it. And uh, and uh, uh, Saga um, and uh, uh, took Jake to various different places on the same route that I went on. And I actually, uh, Saga uh, said to me, that's where Jake stood. And I stood there uh, wow. looking in an estuary, uh, which the estuary actually, uh, the estuary uh, that well, the first estuary I went to, which uh, forms part of the mangrove uh, swamp area. And there's a road that just travels okay. through it, like for a little town. There's almost a, it's yeah, a little town yeah. with a road, and it's got a mangrove swamp on one side, and under the bridge. And we're talking a couple of pipes. We're not even talking like this is a big thing. This is a tiny yeah. thing. Your average village bridge i'm going to describe it as yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and there was a couple a couple of pipes and as i'm looking over i can see that there's fresh water predominantly and as i'm looking over the edge sag is telling me keep your eye out down there sometimes you'll see them with the convict tangs sometimes they'll be on their own you know and then as i'm looking i'm looking down and i'm seeing things like uh, selfing tangs and desjardini and i'm seeing butterflies uh, uh, not a single not a single coral so, in sight by so the way so hang on a minute. This is brackish. This is an estuary. This is this, fresh water this is, running into the sea. 
Yeah, yeah. The sea, the coral reef is approximately one mile, yeah, from where I am. Now, so we're a mile up okay. river, if you like, yeah. And I couldn't believe the diversity of life that I was seeing. It was just uh, mind blowing. In fact, I went done a yep. lot of snorkeling all around the island on the reef. Yeah, I saw some fabulous, usual things, corals and things. Um, but what was really yep. the best thing about Mauritius is its mangrove swamps, without a shadow of a doubt. You right. know, I've done mangroves in the Caribbean before, but to do mangroves in the Indian Ocean or around that way, I mean, I, I would suggest, recommend it to anyone. It's uh, the most diverse habitat that I've uh, that I've certainly ever visited before, and certainly probably right. the the highlight for me. But Jake stood on this bridge, and I stood there, and then the, then the following day. The news came. And it, honestly, I'm getting a chill just thinking about it. it makes me emotional, actually, just thinking about it. Because mm. Sagan went, oh, Jake Adams. I said, oh, dear. I said, did he? Like this. I said, oh, right. Like that. Anyway, still didn't see any, right? Nor did Jake, actually. Jake never saw him either, yeah? And in fact, right. to this day, as far as I'm aware, and I made uh, Papa Yam laugh, I'm the only European that's seen it. So subsequent right. visits around the island. So, so, so. You can imagine these collection sites, yeah, are ferociously secret, yeah. Um, they have to be unfortunately. I'm sure. And, and, uh, and, and yeah. just to clarify, Paul, the fish we're talking about is a Canthus polyzona, the zebra tang, aka yeah, the zebra, zebra tang. tang, in America. Yes, yeah. It's it's. Yeah. If you just describe that fish to us, and obviously a lot of people know about right. it, but you know. Well, the first at first, at first glance, you're going to say, "Oh, look at that convict tank." Actually, when you yeah. start getting into the physiology of the fish, you could straight away, you will, it, it, once you understand the convict and you understand the polyzona, where they are, yeah. how can I put it? It's a, it's a, it's a mimic. It's the, the, com, the, uh, the, uh, the zebra tang is really a mimic of the, it's, it's hanging yes. out with those guys. The convicts are found in yeah. huge aggregations, massive aggregations. Into the uh, mangrove areas, you'll just find the odd one or two convicts. They will go solitary or, you know, or very few. But mm. usually you'll often see uh, convicts in huge aggregations. And the zebra tang sort of piggybacks, right? Now, it's yeah. not the only species in Mauritius that does this, actually. It's something I've not told you, actually, uh, uh, on a previous conversations. Cool. But there's another two fish in Mauritius that piggyback one another. And I've got a little theory on that as well. Okay. So the peacock wrasse, you know, the peacock wrasse? Yes. Yeah, I think they call it the I blue do. star leopard, I believe, in the US. I think there's another name for it, but we know, know it is the peacock wrasse. They also have a, a mimic that, yeah, that's it. They have, have a mimic that hangs with them. That's the lapilus. And as juveniles, right. you will often find the odd lapilus hanging around the group of the peacocks. Now, if I tell you that a male right. peacock grows to about this size um, a male yeah. lapilus grows to this side and to this day they're still okay. misdescribed as i'm sure kai or lemon tyk or whatever uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Kai would tell you the you know, famous ichthyologist he, he will tell you that um it's still described as halicoris uh lap um it's still described as macro uh, uh lapilus but it's actually a halicoris, yeah. i'm sure of it yeah um, so right. what I believe is they're really aggressive, actually. People don't often understand. Lapilus is a fully mature fish. Yeah, they're, they're actually quite aggressive. And, and I believe, and I've seen how they behave with things like a river shrimp or, or shrimp. They <coughs> mm. literally grab hold of it like lots of others in the genus, and they will smash it onto a rock. <coughs> and, uh, and I actually believe they predate on some of the juvenile peacocks, yet they hang around them. So imagine them wow. like a sparrow hawk hanging around the outside yeah, of, a, of yeah. a, a flock yeah. of birds. That's what they're like. But when they're babies, like a cuckoo, the babies will swim, am swim amongst the large aggregations of the uh, peacock wrasse. Now, Polly's owner, the zebra tang, um, again, yeah. uh, so I can absolutely confirm that that fish is found in small aggregations, no more than 12 yeah. to 15 of them at a time. I think, uh, and okay. uh, uh, and very in, in certain areas they're found by themselves, but very often okay. there are also amongst them hybrid convict polyzoan, and we might be. Tell me more. This, this this is important. Go on. 
T- t- yeah. Tell me about so, a polyzona so, so hybrid. First of all, so, so first of all, with a convict tank, it's got a particular shape. With a polyzona, it's sort of more roundish. It's heavier set on the nose. Okay. And when you start to see so, the so habitat... So it's not, it's not, it's not to, just pattern then? We're, we're, no, we're talking about morphology. So side by side, the two yeah. different fish are different shapes. Slightly different. You wouldn't see it at first glance. You'd only see it on mature specimens. Yeah. The skin tones yeah. are even slightly different. The nose, the biggest area is the nose. The nose is quite wide yeah. on a, a polyzona. And I've seen what they predominantly feed on as well, which was fantastic because, you know, now I'm now starting to understand the fish and what they do. And, and it's over. They live in an area that so that so the females, the larger females and males will come in up the up to the man, up to the mangrove zone. They are found out on the reef. You will find the odd polyzona, yeah. like I say, solitary, hanging around with some convict pals, often quite small. Believe it, it's sort of reverse in mm. the uh, the mangrove situation. Ju- mostly in the mangrove situation, you'll find small juveniles of what you see on the reef. But I found with polyzona, it could be round the other way. You're finding some zebras that are quite a sizable that are in the mangrove areas, yeah. But likewise, out on the reef, I'm told that they're quite a bit smaller. But what's really special yeah. is, is in the mangrove zones, so say where they're feeding, they're feeding on ulva, sea lettuce predominantly. But like sea cichlids, lettuce, yeah, yeah. yeah? So like cichlids, so if you know anything about Malawi cichlids, everyone always refers to Mabuna as being vegetarian, right? And uh, But they're not. Yeah. Lots of people think these fish are vegetarian. The it's the stuff in the algae, vegetarian. yeah. Yes, and I think the German words use is afwax or something like that. It's a basically Afwoks, referring yeah, to the, yeah. Co- yeah, the, the copepod life yeah. that lives amongst the uh, old bar. Yeah. So there's polyzona are really feeding on predominantly scraping rocks like convicts do, but convict mouth as well, actually, is another thing. The mouth on a convict slightly different to a polyzona as well, if you look at that. And yeah. I think that polyzona, uh, sorry, convicts particularly, You'll find them head banging, lots of rocks picking all the time on what looks like a bare yeah. rock. Polyzona, they love stuffing themselves up with uh, ulva and sea lettuce and things. And in that environment of volcanic rocks, uh, it's predominantly volcanic rock, not calcareous rock, um, you'll find a lot of okay. the mollusks and things like that on them. So I was absolutely touched that uh, I, I think it was two days just before I left. So I'd spent, I think it was like, four days looking for them right we went to various locations to see them and in the end i got took to the holy grail place to see them uh if you like the boss man top secret knew how yeah he knew how desperate i was to see him so he got me to see them (laughs) so we didn't go catching that day where we were is where we were actually was a national park you couldn't go fishing there right so we snorkeled out into a national park and we found them in this particular area, so you can't go fishing there anyway. Um, and uh, sure. it was gobs- it was gobsmacking. So one minute I'm snorkeling, so literally as I'm dangling my feet over the boat, uh, over the uh, uh, Papi Yam turns around and he says to me, "Oh, there might be a few bull sharks in here." I thought, "Oh, thank bull you for letting me know." <laughs> Just, yeah, 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 because uh, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, the water it literally changes in front of your eyes. One minute it's cloudy green. The next minute, you've got that melt yep. where you've got the fresh water mixing with the seawater, um, uh, which is very disorientating, I can tell you. It's, it's really odd if you've ever mm-hmm. snorkeled in where there are brackish waters, where the river's mixing with the sea, you've got this melt so you can mm-hmm. never really see. You've got the fear of bull sharks behind you as well, thinking about, oh, is there anything <laughs> behind me? Because yeah. you can't really see for a lot more than a roundabout. I'd say the water's quite turbid. We're looking at about five meters i would say is about as much visibility as you will get when it sort of clears but it can literally change in okay. front of your eyes in seconds and it can be an incredibly dangerous place to stalk or i might add as well because of tidal pull and mm. tidal current changes we just got there just at the right time it was like a pond there wasn't a single wave to worry about in the mangrove areas and amongst that in terms of the so trying to understand the habitat we're seeing monos you know, Malayan angels or the mono. Okay, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, dams. yeah, yeah. You'll see damsel fish species. I can't tell you what one that was, but there's a, another chromis type species there. But the, probably the most okay. mind blowing thing of all 
was seeing butterfly fish at 101.15 SG. And, uh, and there's in brackish water. That. So, in brackish water. So we're talking raccoons, the luna particularly, yep. uh, 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 living in these areas, and Ariga as well, living in these areas where you would find a mono. So recently, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. experimenting. Yeah. Back in the farm, there we've got an isolated three for two for two, and I've just actually supplied my first brackish water aruga butterfly to an Instagrammer called Monster Fish UK, I think he's called. If you look him up, Monster Fish okay. UK, you'll see my, you'll see the first UK brackish water aruga butterfly. 1015 is where it's at at the moment. Doing really, wow. really well. So I can only assume that these butterfly fish diet is incredibly different to their mature diet. And the only thing I can't tell okay. you at the moment is, is can butterflies live long, long term in brackish water? And, and I think that all sure. of these fish are, tra are transient. So in other words, even though I saw yep. this zebra tang, in, it, it, I reckon I saw about 10, 12. I might be able to supply you a picture or two for you to add to this. But I saw about 10 okay. or 15 uh, in one go, I think it was. Six to eight was common. Ten to 15 was the most. But you never find them by the hundred. So the zebra soma, uh, yep. the, the, so the zebra tang, is genuinely a, yep. quite a rare species. You'll see way more convict tangs uh, than you would ever see polyzona. Yeah. And you got some in. I got some. I got very, very lucky. Uh, I managed to... I mean, normally, they'll go out, they might get one or two, but recently they've had a stroke of luck. In fact, I wasn't the only guy to land the uh, 10 that I became quite famous for. I was talking to which we might as well say had on the co the, co the convict uh, zebra tang thing. So count the number of stripes, first of all. So very often... A oh, on the around. hybrid? On the hybrid, that could be... Uh, so I think on a, on a standard convict, it's about five. On a zebra, it's about 10. But I saw amongst these, these uh, hybrids, uh, uh, which we might be able to get one later in the year. We'll try. Right, but the hybrid wow. uh, uh, is about seven stripes. But the difference is, although it looks more like a <clears throat> convict, it has the same nature as well, because the behaviour is different as well. So a convict tends to float okay. about doing his thing, head back in, you know, they, they're much more frantic. Anyone who's had any um, yes. uh, separate tangs before, they'll tell you they're mental. They're like Gattatus tanks. They just fly around. You know, you do need a big system really long term. Even if you've got, you know, a relatively small one, they need, they're an energetic fish. They're more muscular. And that's probably down to that tidal pole that I was saying. You remember these fish, imagine, imagine like salmon, you know, they've got to fight against the yeah, currents yeah, and yeah. fight against the river. So they're a very muscular, small, round fish, if you like, more or less. Yeah. Um, but yeah, count strikes. Wow. Um, any, I mean, aquarium care, um, they'll eat anything, will they? Obviously, they need, you um, know, lots of flow, lots of space. Yeah. I mean, uh, plenty of pellets. They will wean onto a commercial diet very quickly. And I think that's really important. You cannot maintain these fish just on the likes of something that's very low protein, like frozen mice or brine shrimp, yeah. which they'll absolutely <laughs> smash to death. You'd have to feed them on the hour every hour with that. Um, They're going to go I, skinny, I aren't suggest, they? Yeah. Yeah, they, and mine do. Even my ones do. They will mm. lose weight quick, particularly if you're treating them with copper mm. oil, because they are most of these fish, are, you know, they will come with some form of internal parasite, very much like uh, Mabuna, yeah. like the freshwater cichlid in the yeah. Malawis, you know, where they're grazing all the time. Any grazing animal is prone to some sort of level of intestinal worm. But I don't always believe it's always intestinal Absolutely. worms. It's just literally the nut amount of food that you need to give them. And in a commercial situation, Agreed. you have to be very, very careful. I'm always nagging the boys. Eight feeds a day, I tell them. Ten feeds a day. You know, mm -hmm. you can literally feed a zebra tang on the hour, every hour with a few pellets. And that's why I would yeah. suggest that you do to wean them. When you first get one, make sure you uh, quickly wean them onto... Oh, you've, I've been using the Seaweed Extreme by Hikari 
I've recently yep. been using the T yep. TDO Chroma Boost, which is the uh, one from Reef Nutrition. It's pretty good. Um, but any commercial flake or pellet that has a profile, about 45% protein or up, would uh, be good. And don't worry too much about their herbivore previous only diet. Like I said, they're amongst the ulva are the crustaceans as well and they will be nibbling them i even saw one go for a river shrimp recently so which i was feeding another species in i can believe so, it i can believe but, it I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've seen powder blue tangs um eat river shrimp so there you go yes but, yeah. um okay so, brilliant uh, so lots um, of food lots of food and um, have you got any mm. left if anyone in the uk wants to buy any we've got three or four specimens left on there we have just took another delivery in from mauritius at the moment which is currently in quarantine um at, at the moment i'm trying to teach them out there as well we need better sizing uh, the last ones we received were quite okay. large so it's been hard trying to find systems that are big enough to take them the small ones are okay. incredibly desirable we did get lucky the shipment before last we have a few small ones that are sort of about this big and they're the ones to get you know, uh, if you can get them, because yeah. of course they're easier to wean. Yeah, they're easy. They're going to fit in quite well. But um, you know, you can't, can't beat a juvenile if you can find one. Beautiful. Okay, so that ties us in nicely again with um, were De Jong out there with you? Some of the guys from De Jong. <clears throat> uh, I was. Uh, I had no idea. I was sat there on Diwali. I have to say, up a big shout out to the Grogan family because they spoiled the death out, me, Joe. Yeah, they took to me at, I, I, and honestly, uh, I, I, there's a video coming out of, uh, about the packing and the ornamental marine limited, which is, uh, you know, uh, there's the there's the commercial bit coming on my YouTube channel at some stage. But the Garobi family, I cannot stress enough what beautiful people. I, I mean, they, they fed, I mean, I didn't ask that, they insisted. They fed me every night. Yeah. Um, I sat there, I sat there and, uh, uh, drunk scotch for the old man which which was fantastic funny <laughs> funny guy as well the guy that actually catches the fish for me if you like who's i think he's about 60 odd years old now he's he look good he look, looks much younger for his age certainly but they absolutely yep. um sport uh, uh, sport the death out i mean uh, the rugby family so what was the question sorry the young what was the question yeah the, the, the guys from so the anyway, right we, there so so we've been invited for to Bali. Yeah, so it's, it's the bar. It's Christmas Day in our world, if you know what I mean. So I'd already been out with okay. uh, Saka delivering delivering sweets to his uh, what they call the Indian sweets to their to their clients and things like that. And um, and all of a sudden, uh, Saga turns around to me and said, hey, "Do you know Tom from the Young?" And I said, "Oh, but it's Tom Verhoeven." And I said, "Well, the name's familiar." Well, funny enough, I think it was a couple of weeks before, mm. and I'd had a quick trip over to the Young. And um, and Thomas was showing me around the facility, and he showed me um, these books that have been written by, and it was Tom Hoven, and I had no idea yeah. I'd be sat with re uh, reefing royalty. Um, anyone who's not familiar with that name, I'm sure you already are, but anyone who's not familiar with that name, this is the Jesus uh, Jesus Christ of the marine <laughs> fishing breeding world. He's this this guy, this guy is just unreal. He's just, he's, he, you know, I was, up, you know, guy should have a halo around him. I mean, we've got Jamie on the coral side of things <laughs> on the spot. But this yeah. guy, I mean, he, he's just mind-blowing. And I'll tell you something really special about this young man. Not only is he just breeding fish like it's going out of fashion. I mean, he's just unreal. Yeah. We're going to see, in the, in, the in the next few years, we're going to see some amazing things from Dion. They have invested Wow. I'm going to say millions into their fish breeding facility. Um, I've seen some... That facility people. looks amazing. Well, uh, uh, for the first time in my life, I realised that you can't have fish tanks the way that we know them. We're all about rectangles, yeah, okay. mostly, yeah? Well, when you're fish breeding, sure. it's more about deep tanks, yeah? And I've, I was lucky enough deep. to be shown around with Thomas. Um, and uh, Tom, this is what makes him special. When I'm sat at the dinner table with him, and I started talking to her. We had obviously had lots to talk about. And he said, um, he said to me, no secrets. No secrets. And this is why this guy is really special. As far as he's concerned, the knowledge should be there for everyone. 
in the past we've seen right. have very famous companies which i'm not going to name any names or be pressured into naming names but we've seen some incredibly important fish breeding aquaculture facilities around the world that produce fish but yeah. they ain't going to tell you nothing yeah that 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 money oh, for I some of these people yeah. has, co has come in from government sources initially and that's that's the bit that hurts sometimes is when your scientist becomes commercial all right i like to keep my scientists sure. if you like ideally you know you stay as a scientist let us do the commercial <laughs> bit but yeah. um he he's yeah. categorically made a point of telling me that uh, there'll be no secrets so if people want to learn from tom verhoeven you can yeah and he will be writing papers wow. that will be accessed you'll be able to access those papers there'll be no secrets and currently yeah. i know the species that he's trying to breed and the other thing that he said which i believe is actually thomas's ethos or more so de jong is focusing on breeding species and yeah and he's keeping them cheap he doesn't want to see this level okay. i mean obviously they've got a they've obviously got to accrue their money back i mean these you know people always go why is the yellow tanks you know why is the yellow tang so much money you know well have a go yourselves because breeding a yellow <laughs> tang will require yeah. hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars or pounds or more yeah to even think about doing it then there's the demand then there's about have, and yeah. then there's the situation of having no life you know if you get into breeding mm. uh, uh big <laughs> you've got no life yeah. left unless you've got unless you've got staff that you can stand in for you all the time that are as good as you are and it's the same actually i think with, with spalding corals and stuff you need to be there you can't just like forget about it let's get course. on with it you know so your life is taken over with breeding these fish but you know Tom, tom's uh and thomas's uh tom and thomas's viewpoint is as cheap as they can produce them so because they want to see the hobby carry on and carry on irrespective of worldwide yeah. international trade bans, they want to be able to provide uh fish at very affordable cost for the hobbyist that is their sole objective and tom when he said to me because we was having a few drinks at the time he said to me he went yeah there's going to be no secrets and you know and he said to me when you get back he said if there's anything that you need or any knowledge that you need just get in touch and funny enough as wow. soon as i touched the soil there was a question i forgot to I couldn't remember what he told me about what i call the clownfish problem so tank bred species okay. they do have they do have a lot of problems yeah so yep. even the uh even the biota uh uh de Jongi grammar i've you know it's been sent to me with a flared gill or it's got problems as such you know like yes. um yeah uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah and and they also pick up viruses really really quickly you know the problem with tank bred species is as soon as you introduce them to their wild counterparts they've got very little immune system yeah so they of need course. time to they need time and clownfish or fancy clownfish particularly uh cl fancy clownfish particularly uh, i've found in recent times through hybridization and hybridization they're almost so clinically bred now that as soon as you put them amongst wild stock, they'll very quickly contract yeah. problems. And there's a particular problem yeah. that I need to iron out with him. Unfortunately, and I will we'll have to wish him well, he's just got back after another big talk or conference he did. So it's Mauritius. He came back, went back to Holland. Then he went to a big conference. I can't remember what one it was, but it was a big international conference that followed it. And shortly after that, he got meningitis. Right. And it, of course, oh. we all know that men, meningitis is a shocking problem. Um, and Serious. He's only, yeah. yeah, he's only just returned to work. And I believe that some of his memory and bits and pieces like that are, but he's at the moment. He's, so, you know, fingers crossed for Tom Verhoeven. But ultimately, he's, he's uh, yeah. going to be well. one of yeah. the he's going to be one of the future saints of our trade and hopefully we will see in the uk in a not too distant future you know a new batch of grammar de Jongi, a new batch of yellow tang and oh, some jenny acanthus nice. angels as well um i mean he's got when i was walking I'll around there i'll take some of them yeah yeah when i was walking around there and so you've got the usual clownfish that they've been breeding for years at de Jong, and a sea horses obviously yeah. as well um yeah. But there's, the, the usual suspects are already being bred, shall we say, and even some other varieties as well, some really rare clowns from 
Aussie land as well that they're breeding as well. But clowns are clowns, you know, and what we need to do is think out of the box because there's no, if we ever end up in a situation where captive bred only species are available, we need more than clownfish to invigorate the hobbit. So right now we're seeing some yeah. wonderful fish coming out of Bali Aquarish. Um, yeah, a big shout yeah. out to them. I mean, we're seeing some beautiful little uh, angel species coming from there. Uh, and, 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 of course, biota as well. But, you know, we've seen this year at AAC alone, we've had Parasentropygi uh, venustus. I mean, what a fish. That fish oh, yeah, they're lovely, specimen. aren't they? Yeah. Little and tank that bread, yeah. fish is a wild specimen. I don't know. Or, uh, there's one guy I know of that managed to keep one going for a number of years. But Paracentropagy venustus is one of the most difficult specimens yeah. that there are to maintain in captivity. And now we're getting tank bred ones of those. We've, I've got a tank bred bicolour yeah. angel. Um, I've got at the moment. Nice. We've seen uh, tank bred uh, blue uh, lion angels as well. Um, they're coming oh, yeah, thick and yeah. fast. The majestic uh, tank bred majestics as well. Uh, regal right. angels. The tank bred regal, regal angels are just unbelievable. I just love them. There's all the beautiful little juvenile specimens with all your squiggly markings all over them. So but the future's bright with fish breeding. The future's bright. And with someone like Tom Verhoeven based in Europe, we're not going to be completely dependent upon someone out in Asia and someone out in the U.S., just provide us with tank bred species. Um, I think yes. talking about we we're talking about coral farms earlier on. Um, I think for me, like I said, I will always do it. I'll always be involved. I'll always be trying to get. Yeah, yeah. But my interest is now steering in a new area, and I think uh, for yeah. me, it's time for me to. You know, one thing I've never done, Jeremy, is is I've done a lot of things the aquatic trade, but I've never bred fish apart from the usual tropical sub suspects the usual tropical sure, water. sure. so it's, t- it's time for me to learn a new craft and um, i'm hoping in yeah. february that i'll be dipping my toe into a new world i'm just currently um getting a building prepared at the moment where i might well be uh, doing something new in it which i'm not going to say now but i'm wow. ho- hoping mm. to be getting involved with that side of things into the new year very exciting watch this space okay we've got about 10 minutes left i just want to kind of quiz you quickly on a few different things um okay products that have launched this year paul um the time is coming where i'm compiling the annual top 10 product launches that reef builders have covered this year anything notable uh for me the red sea reef mat crops up i think that's a big launch i was just about what do you to think? say well, I was just about to say Red Sea Reef. I, I literally was. Yeah. Yeah. And I t- I'll tell you for a reason yeah. why, because uh, uh, n- not many people probably know, but I was one of the first to sign a non-disclosure for the Claracy uh, before uh, okay. D&D were distributing it. And uh, when the, the uh, uh, pretty uh, lovely guy called Daryl, who used to run a company called Simply Aquaria, yes. was uh, developing yeah. this product... Uh, he asked me and a couple of other people. I don't believe I was the only one. I think there were a few others that designed this non-disclosure. You know, it was sold to us as a, uh, how can I put it, almost like a reactor would be sold. In other words, you haven't got to strain yeah. the living daylights of every drop of seawater <laughs> from your system, sir. It wasn't yeah. about completely a spotless sump. The idea was that we were bringing this idea yeah, to a fruition whereby that, I actually pump fed my reactors. I still do to this day, uh, my uh, fleece yeah. filters, and I still do to this day. I do oh, not okay. fix them up to the down, down drains on them. You know, if anything, I think that yeah. they should be looked at in a slightly different way. They're an incredibly useful tool. And on a fish-only marine system, yes, yeah, strain the living daylights out the water because it's going to help you with parasite yeah. control and that type of thing. But on a mm. reef tank, with all the burning mm. principles that we've uh, learned over the years you can overdo it i believe you can overdo it but the red sea reef mat the reason why i'm going to put that at the top despite my mixed feelings on fleece filters which is quite well known even i'll sell them i'll tell everyone but 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 for me the red sea reef mat is because it was such a finished product from the ground up you know when you won't take that out of a box yeah it feels right um, uh, the design on it, you know, there are criticisms by other manufacturers I've had to endure, 
uh, about it. But generally, uh, uh, and also the idea of tying it into software. Now, I'm not a massive techie fan, as I said mm. earlier, but but the idea of having yeah. the fleece filter and actually being able to watch it and how long the roll is and how much has been used and that sort of adding the technology yeah. to a fleece filter, which, of course, the technology is free. So you're buying a fleece yeah. filter, but you're also getting the technology for free. So for me, just the finished product, the robust build quality, too much stuff is made too cheaply to, to this day. You know, there are discerning sure. keepers like myself that is happy to pay more. And even with well, one of the mm. biggest ranges that I sell, uh, which would be Neptune, I'd encourage them, can you please just try a bit harder? You know, service and support, superb. <laughs> and, of course, you get that with Red Sea. Yeah. But for me, it would be the Red Sea yeah. Reef, Matt. Ooh, other new products out there. Well, of course, the G6. So, I mean, you know. G6, oh, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, so uh, for uh, me, just on that note, Paul, the, um, mm. the oh, what was I going to say? The Red Sea Reef Mat. I've forgotten now. Mm. I've forgotten what product I was going to say. Gifts. I think I was talking about. Yeah, so, so obviously Christmas is coming. Um, mm. Go on. So what about a gift for a reef keeper? I mean, are we talking a voucher? Is that the safest? Or, I don't know, I like think, a I test think, kit? I, I or? Think, yeah, I think if you want to buy someone something it, 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 as such for a, a reef keeper for Christmas, for example, should always be a gift voucher. Because everyone's yeah. tank, so uh, everyone's aquarium is so intricate and can have so many different... And I've seen it before. We've had, uh, we, in fact, we refuse now. You know, oh, I just want to buy my husband fish for Christmas. What one can he have? And I yeah, go, well, yeah. look, unless we know what you've got. Yeah. You know, so I would always discourage Christmas gifts as such and, and say, please, yes, please support your LFS wherever you are. Go and support your mm. LFS. And mm. please try and support mm. them with they've got livestock. You know, the, the, the online mm. situation where we've got store, uh, where we've got businesses that are, I know they do a great job. They get your goods to your door and they do it very speedily. Yes, you get a few points and all the rest of it. But ultimately, you know, you should really spend your money with a livestock based dealer because if you take the livestock, remove the water from retail, the game is over. So go and buy a gift yeah. voucher, support your local store that way. That'd be my, my that would be for me the right answer. Perfect. And that just about wraps it up. Thank you so much, Paul. I, I know no, we could no talk problem. more. And guys, if, 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 if you want another session with Paul, then um, hopefully he'll oblige us and, and, and we can talk some more. But um, the show has come to an end. So thanks again to AAC and Paul Hughes um, and uh, pop down to his store in Harlow, Essex, UK. Um, and if you want to subscribe to Reef Therapy, we would be eternally grateful. Watch it on YouTube or download it on your favourite podcasting app. I've been Jeremy Gay. This is Reef Builders Reef Therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks, Paul.